GCN just released a three-part video series on the ketogenic diet and how it affects cycling performance. In this series, presenter Jeremy Powers tries the diet for himself and talks to some experts. In this video, I'll go into the science on the ketogenic diet and how it affects endurance sports performance to determine whether or not Jeremy should be following this diet, but more importantly, whether or not you should. I'll of course touch on how going keto affects your performance, but also whether or not it's a good option for weight loss. Welcome back to another video. We're back here talking about the ketogenic diet. A little over a year ago, I did a similar video to this one responding to a video that Emily Batty made about her diet. And now GCN has put out not one, but three videos talking about the ketogenic diet to further muddy the waters on a topic that really shouldn't be all that muddy. Going off on GCN and keto, this kid thinks he's the next durian rider. Watch, his next video is going to be about how disc brakes on road bikes caused COVID. Now I will say that GCN does not endorse this diet. They're very clear about that in their disclaimer, probably to avoid getting sued. Now I need to say this to you all. The information contained in this video is for entertainment purposes only. Please, please, please do not make any changes to your lifestyle without discussing it with your doctor or healthcare provider. We can accept no liability for any injuries sustained. These three videos aren't the first that they've made on the topic, and they generally take the stance of, well, it may work for some, who's to know? But ultimately, I'm not saying keto diets are good or bad. Quite simply, there just hasn't been enough studies or evidence published on it yet to fully understand the, the benefits and limitations of it. And the answer I don't know is a completely reasonable answer to have if the science on a topic consistently shows mixed results. However, when it comes to the ketogenic diet and sports performance, the balance of evidence is clearly pointing in one direction. I'll be getting into all of that, but before I do, I want to make it clear that I'm not trying to bash GCN or Jeremy Powers. They've done similar videos for fasted training, weight loss, a plant-based diet, and they even have a book on cycling on a plant-based diet. So they're really not partial to keto. I've got a huge amount of respect for Jeremy, and in these videos, he comes off more like a journalist acting as a guinea pig for the benefit of the viewer, which is great. All I want to do is shine some light on this topic. For those of you who don't know, the ketogenic diet is a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet, the goal of which is to get into a ketogenic state where you're using fat as your primary fuel source instead of carbs. This in theory could be advantageous for cyclists because glycogen or your body's stored carbohydrates doesn't need to be relied on for energy, and therefore you won't bonk when you run out of it. In GCN's recent three-part video series on the diet, Jeremy tries the diet for himself. In the first video, he tests his 5-minute and 20-minute power on and off the diet. In his second video, he rides 100 miles in ketosis. And in his third video, he talks to some experts on the diet. Let's start with the first video. Jeremy managed 407 watts for 5 minutes and 341 watts for 20 minutes on the high carb diet at a weight of 72.5 kilos. He then did 391 watts for 5 minutes and 347 watts for 20 minutes at a lower weight of 69 kilos on the keto diet, raising his watts per kilogram for both efforts. I got messages from people when this video came out asking, what the hell man, I thought you said that keto made you slow. Checkmate bro, it looks like keto makes you faster. This internet video and the two podcasts that I listened to about it are all the proof I need. Before we all start eating sticks of butter before our ride, let's remember that this was an N of 1 experiment, meaning that there was one subject. And in this case, that one subject didn't do repeated tests, so there's really very little that we can conclude from this. And it also seems clear that Jeremy really wanted this diet to work. Low carb and loving it. This is the first breakfast that we've got here. I honestly feel awesome. <laughs> I do. I feel super energetic. I feel almost like really sprightly and uh, excited to go about my day. And I've been checking my ketones on, on a little meter that I have here. Mm -hmm. um, just to see what they come in at and I've been as high as like yeah close to one um, which does obviously is not full-blown but even when I'm close to one I feel like wow this is awesome. This in itself could be a confounding factor. We know the power that the placebo effect can have. For example it's been shown that when subjects were told that they had ingested caffeine they showed symptoms of caffeine ingestion even though they in fact hadn't had any caffeine at all. They theorized that placebo effects occurred because the goal primed participants we're non-consciously working to achieve the goal of cooperation. Essentially, if you know caffeine will make you feel a certain way, then you may unconsciously work slightly harder to make it so. 
Let's take it out of the context of this study. Let's say you know that caffeine makes you feel good on the bike, so you work just a little bit harder on the bike to make it true. The placebo effect is far from limited to caffeine and has been thoroughly studied, and motivation may play a role in the placebo effect. If you're determined that something will make you faster, that alone is a huge confounding variable and will only increase the size of the placebo effect. Jeremy seemed like he really wanted to make this diet work, and it's very likely that he pushed himself a little bit harder when in ketosis, whether he was conscious of it or not. Taking all of this into consideration, there's really very little that we can conclude from this experiment. Let's take a look at what the research has to say in regards to how the ketogenic diet affects your performance in order to get a clearer picture. Proponents of the ketogenic diet will often cite studies like this one on the metabolic characteristics of keto-adapted ultrarunners that looked at runners and triathletes, some of which were high carb and some of which were low carb. Not too surprisingly, peak oxidation rates were twofold higher in the low carb group meaning they were using more fat as fuel. This is great. It means that following a high fat diet does in fact allow you to use a higher amount of fat as fuel, meaning that you're less reliant on your limited glycogen stores. This is the whole point of going on a ketogenic diet as an endurance athlete in the first place. But let's keep in mind here that cycling is not a sport where the winner is determined by who can burn more fat than everyone else. It's determined by who can ride their bike faster than everyone else. So performance matters. Let's look at some studies that investigate performance. This study looked at the ketogenic diet's influence on performance in experienced off-road cyclists by taking eight subjects and having them perform a continuous exercise protocol after consuming a ketogenic diet and a standard diet for four weeks. They found that subjects had a significantly higher max workload and lactate threshold with the standard diet, and the study concluded that the ketogenic diet decreased the ability to perform high intensity work. The same has been found in elite race walkers. When testing their 10K race performance after changing their diet, they found that the high carb and periodized carb group improved their time, while the high fat group did not. While you may be burning more fat for fuel when you're in ketosis, the signs suggest that your performance will actually suffer. Even the natural production of ketones over the course of an ultra marathon race doesn't seem to be a good predictor of success. This study found that runners that produce ketones did not see better results than those who didn't. And on top of this, low carb diets have been shown to reduce one's desire to exercise. These are just a couple studies, but the balance of evidence when looking at the research as a whole points in the same direction. This review on the topic concluded that despite renewed popular interest in high fat, low carb diets for endurance sports, fat rich diets do not spare carbohydrates or improve training capacity and performance, but instead directly impair rates of muscle glycogenolysis and energy flux. The research paints a pretty clear picture, and while you can find examples of elite athletes here and there that follow ketogenic diet, this review points out that this is not the diet that the vast majority of elite athletes follow. They state that if a high fat diet was an advantage, then the best athletes would be doing it, but they're not. Kenyan distance runners and Tour de France cyclists have been reported to consume 7 to 12 grams of carbohydrates per kilogram of body weight per day, pretty much the exact opposite of a ketogenic diet. The world's best athletes are not following a ketogenic diet. To quote an earlier video from GCN on this very topic. And further to this, having spoken to coaches and riders, I can tell you that no one is competing and racing in the Tour de France on a ketogenic diet. But Jeremy does bring in top level keto athlete Zach Bitter, who suggests that once you're in ketosis, reintroducing some carbohydrates for hard workouts may provide an advantage. Go that low in carbohydrate and Either then once you've kind of done that for about a month, usually that's when I'll start having folks get back into their training plan. And once they get into the training plan, we can start teasing out some specific workouts. We can start bringing back some carbohydrate sources uh, sporadically around some bigger sessions or some harder sessions. This is something that I've heard a lot from proponents of the ketogenic diet. If you stay in ketosis and only use carbs when you absolutely need them, then it'll be the best of both worlds. It's certainly a reasonable assumption to make, but does it actually work in practice? This study tested this idea with well-trained cyclists and had them consume a normal carb-rich diet or a high-fat diet for six days, followed by one day of carb loading. They found that the high-fat diet did increase fat oxidation, and there was no significant difference 
in a 100K time trial performance. However, times were three minutes and 44 seconds slower when subjects were fed the high fat diet. Subjects also performed significantly worse in 1K sprints after eating the high fat diet. This is extremely important. Following a low carb diet may actually reduce your body's ability to use carbohydrates during exercise because of a down regulation of carbohydrate metabolism. Going back to this review on carb dependence, they state that this down regulation of carbohydrate metabolism underpins the reductions in high intensity exercise capacity observed after high fat feeding. Carbohydrate, not fat based fuels, are the predominant fuel for the working muscles, and carbohydrate, not fat, availability becomes rate limiting for performance. This is actually the concern pointed out by Brianna Stubbs that convinces Jeremy that this whole keto thing may not be such a good idea. On the ketogenic diet, it's fairly well um, documented now that over time your body gets much better at burning fat and you start to lose some of that carb burning capacity. You get changes in your enzyme expression and um, changes in the enzyme activity that means that generally um, it's accepted that you might lose some of that high-end sprint performance if you go into being in ketosis the whole time. Okay, so one potentially long-term impact from ketosis is one's ability to to burn carbohydrate at the same rate in the future. That was the part of the interview where I spun things down and then I pretty much ran upstairs to start eating some baked potatoes straight away. This is not to say that you should never ride in a low carb state. Nigel Mitchell points this out. We have like a three day block where the, on the first day, this is the day where they'll be doing more intensity within the training that they're doing. And you know, there'll be, uh, the bodies will be really quite uh, restored with carbohydrate. And as they're going through those three days, then naturally their bodies will be a little bit more depleted. So very often when they get to the third day, they're already in quite depleted state. And a lot of riders will actually use that to do either any fasted or some form of a controlled carbohydrate day. So what they're actually trying to do is, is what I would call like concurrent training so you've got some of the work on the earlier days which is really much more glycolytic burning the carbohydrate and then on the other days they're really trying to drive much more of that fat metabolism and the idea of periodizing carbohydrate intake is supported in the literature this study on periodization of carbohydrates put this to the test by having the experimental group perform workouts in an order where they would do a high intensity glycogen depleting workout in a fed state and then do a low intensity workout the next day after an overnight fast. What they found was that the fasted group significantly improved their 20K time trial performance, while the control group did not. Now I will say that fasted training is a tricky subject and the results from studies done on fasted training are mixed, but at least there's some supporting evidence. And riding in a fasted state or having low carb days where you're not doing much activity is very different than following a ketogenic diet where you're constantly eating low carb. To be fair, there are studies here and there that show that while ketosis doesn't benefit performance, at least it doesn't impair performance. However, these are vastly outnumbered by the studies that show decrements of a ketogenic diet. And remember, we're looking for performance improvement. If you had to go through all that work of getting into ketosis, meticulously counting carbs, and having an overly restricted diet just to come out the other end with the same performance, I still call that a net loss. Definitely can get boring. There needs to be a certain amount of creativity in the kitchen to keep it interesting. And again, restrictive. That would be my only like negative on that side. Before we get into keto for weight loss, I'll wrap up the performance question with a quote from this review on periodized nutrition for athletes. The ketogenic diet has received considerable attention in the popular press and many claims have been made recently. However, it's important to realize that to date, not a single study has demonstrated performance benefits of a ketogenic diet. Now onto weight loss using the ketogenic diet, which is probably the most popular reason to follow the diet and could increase your performance if you have weight to lose, even if it does rob you of some of your power. The reason why low carb diets are so popular for weight loss is because results happen fast. Within a week of going on the diet, you may be down five pounds. A 159 when I started this, so let's see what she says here. 154. So I've lost over five pounds of water weight since I started doing this. There's one problem though. The weight you lost is almost entirely water weight. For example, this study on fat versus carbohydrate restriction found that a low carb diet did result in more weight loss, but not more fat loss. The reason, low carb diets result in greater lean mass loss, mainly through the loss of water weight. Fat restriction led to more body fat loss than carb restriction, even when calories were equal. And despite the ketogenic diet's popularity amongst bodybuilder types, ketosis is not a favorable state to be in to support muscle growth. This study, which had subjects complete a two month resistance training program on a ketogenic and regular diet, found that the non-keto group gained almost a kilo of muscle, 
but the ketogenic group actually lost a small amount of muscle mass, and they concluded that the ketogenic diet might not be useful to increase muscle mass. The one thing that ketosis has going for it is that it can suppress your appetite. However, from the standpoint that it reduces your water weight, limits your muscle growth, and results in less body fat loss, it's not a body composition friendly diet. And for those of you who think it's a good idea to go on a ketogenic diet in the off season to shed some pounds and then reintroduce carbs during the season for performance, unfortunately with the increase in carbs comes the water weight, so you'll be right back at square one. Videos like the three-part series that GCN put out make it seem like there's a long list of pros and cons to a ketogenic diet. So between those conversations that we've had, my experiences in the previous two videos, I feel like it really did give a clear picture into the pros and cons of eating this way. In reality, there's a very long list of cons and an almost non-existent list of pros, and anybody who argues otherwise is simply not basing their opinion on the balance of evidence. You have no idea what you're talking about. Going keto changed my life. Sure, I have a hard time riding above zone 2, I have no motivation to train, I haven't taken a shit in 3 weeks, I have dark circles under my eyes and my cholesterol is in the quadruple digits, but when I go on a long ride, I don't have to eat as many gels, so, you know, worth it. I hope this video cleared some things up. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like and a comment, subscribe for weekly science-based cycling videos just like this one, and share this video with your cycling friends. I'll see you in the next one.